As we navigate through these challenging times, we are reminded of how fortunate we are to be part of this strong community, SPE, that supports each other to accomplish great things. It is the power of this community that will propel us through this to better times. On the 18th of April 2020, SPE Unilag organized a webinar on production enhancement through wellbore treatment, via the Cisco WebEx application. The facilitator of the session was Mr. Yami, a production engineer working with Nigerian Petroleum Development Company, NPDC. He explained skin and the causes of formation damage, highlighting the criteria of well selection for stimulation, and the overall effect on production and ultimately, revenue. The session highlighted practical case studies where microemulsion treatment technology was used. Of the seed you are injecting into the reservoir and your reservoir fluid. So, because you do not want to inject an acid that will react with your reservoir fluid and precipitate additional the near well bore. So, maybe when you carry out your laboratory analysis, you notice that once the reservoir fluid and the acid react, the precipitate in solution. Uh, compounds. So what you need to do is you need to do pre flush to make sure that there's a there's a space, there's a gap between the uh, reservoir fluid and the acid to avoid the precipitation of um, insoluble compounds that will hinder the, uh, your productivity after the stimulation work. And after that, about it, you do you you've done your um, uh, laboratory analysis, and you notice that they are compatible, so they will not uh, precipitate insoluble compounds. So you, this it's not necessary you do a non-acid reflux. So, but in a case in which it will lead to the precipitation of an insoluble compound, it is better you do a non-acid reflux. And after that, you go to the acid reflux. Then the main treatment, HF treatment, more acid, is a mixture of uh, HCl and HF. Then after that. Uh, overflush to ensure that the acid penetrates deeper into the formation. Now, immediately after the over, overflush, then you do the flow back so that all the spent acid can flow back into the well and come back to the to the surface. So the flow back period um, happens. Then um, let me quickly move on because of the time. The matrix matrix treatment design. Uh, I will dwell a little bit on this because it's similar to. The kind of design you adopt for microemulsion treatment. The first is you want to select the right candidate. A, a, when you stimulate the wrong well, you always have the wrong results. So one of the things that you want to ensure is that you want to ensure that you stimulate the right well. You identify that the well actually have formation damage. You identify that the well have actually have formation that this is very key. Because if you stimulate a well that does not have formation damage, the impairment from, from production will come from various sources. It could come from maybe somebody did a slick line job and then um, he lost a tool in the hole, which has created additional pressure drop within the tubing. That could lead to formation damage. So, but if you don't have an understanding of that and you go ahead and you stimulate for a well that is the impairment is coming as a result of something else, you might not really get something. So it is good you identify the right candidate. I will share with you some of the criteria that we adopted before a particular simulation job that we carried out. We looked at those uh, criteria and then uh, it, it worked well for us. So we can also review it and see how to adopt it uh, maybe when you move into the professional space. Then you have to establish the nature and the location of damage because it, the way you treat um, paraffin the deposit, position is different from how you treat fine migration, it's different from how you treat um, other forms of damage. So it's important you identify what is the nature of the damage, where is the damage. Those things are very important. And you select the right fluid and the various additives. You determine the right pressure and injection rates, establish the volume, if determine the placement strategy. Are you using uh, coil to be, or are you just popping from the surface, or are you using balls, or are you using uh, uh, this viscous fluid. So you need to 
identify what kind of placement strategy that is best suited for your well. Though I would like to advise that for old wells, wells um, that have been completed for 20, 30 years, you would understand that the, there's a possibility that the tubing would have really corroded. So when you try to go ahead, you might have additional damage in the near well bore because you because of the because of the corrosive because of the corrosion in the tubing. So it is best you might use uh, coil tubing. Coil tubing is more expensive, but it leads to lesser damage in your well. So um, define your shorting slash cleanup stages. Then you assess the profitability. Then um, a brief talk about um, microemulsion. Microemulsions are mono dispersed um, spherical droplets of water in oil or oil in water. They usually contain surfactant and co surfactant. The difference between, I know we have all seen emulsion. When you pour water in oil, pour maybe granite oil in water, and you agitate it, you notice um, oil droplets within the continuous phase of water. But the difference between these micro is that the droplets are usually very small. They are very small, so you cannot identify it with your naked eyes. They are very small. They look like almost a, a clean fluid, but they are not clean fluid. There are some droplets of emulsion within that um, uh, mixture. So the, the, the advantage of that kind of mixture is that it gives you a wider surface area. So the surface area helps the, the wider surface area of contrast, helps the micro to have a very low surface tension. It combines the ultra low surface tension and ultra high detergency to diffuse into perforated rock matrix and spontaneously solubilize oil and remove damaging emulsion. So the ultra low surface tension of the micro emulsion and ultra high detergency helps it to diffuse into rock matrix and solubilize oil. Maybe when you have um, um, wettability change as a result of your near reservoir rock has been changed from water wet to becoming oil wet. So the micro emulsion can solubilize the oil, restoring the wettability of your near uh, well bore. In fact, it has been proven that um, micro emulsion has the capacity of even restoring the near well bore permeability to the initial permeability of the reservoir. So, which is which is a very very good. Acid treatment. So that is one of the unique things about uh, micro emulsion. It can restore your near well bore to the initial reservoir permeability. But before you deploy it, like I said earlier, during the acid treatment, that laboratory compatibility analysis is very, very important to formulate the right specification of the micro emulsion uh, recipe. It's important to carry out a laboratory analysis before you go ahead to deploy the micro emulsion treatment. So, um, if we look at a particular case where it was deployed. So, uh, we deployed it um, in two wells. I'm just trying to be fast. Okay, before I go to the case, let me discuss the criteria we adopted in deciding which well to stimulate. You know. As a production engineer, you have a lot of wells you are looking at, and um, normally production decreases. Um, so you would like to investigate where is the decrease in production coming from. The fact that you have a reduction in production, that doesn't mean that you necessarily need to mass stimulate the well. So you need to come up with criteria to determine whether you need to stimulate a well or not. So these are some of the criteria we looked at before deciding on two wells we needed to stimulate. So we looked at reservoirs with high permeability and high reservoir pressure. Permeability is very key. So if the um, stimulation, we can restore the permeability of the near well bore, it cannot increase it. So look at we looked at um, reservoirs because we do not want to fail it. This was the first time my company will be making use of uh, micro emulsion technology. So we don't want to ensure that, uh, no, second time rather, we don't want to ensure that we go ahead and carry the stimulation job Field. So we looked at reservoirs with high permeability and um, high reservoir pressure. You know, stimulation would always lead to an increase in water cost. After stimulating a well, your water cost goes up. So we looked at well with uh, water cost less than 
and we give preference to wells with gravel park. We give preference to wells with gravel park. And we also try to establish that the impairment is localized, meaning that we looked at the production from different uh, wells producing from a particular reservoir. So if we notice a general trend in reduction in uh, uh, production, it could be as a result of a decline in reservoir pressure that led to the uh, reduction in production. So we, to, we try to establish that the impairment in that particular well is localized. So we looked at the mineralogy of that reservoir. We looked at the clay content and the likes. And uh, we also ensure that the reduced productivity is not caused by reduction in reservoir pressure. I think I've spoken about that. And we looked at wells with high skin. Don't forget what I said about high skin. I said, once you have skin, you need to decompose that skin to be able to identify wells with high formation damage, skin causing arising from high formation damage. And we also looked at remaining reserves because it is not, there's no point stimulating a well uh, where the reservoir reserve is um, slow, it's so low. So there's no point in stimulating that well. So we looked at wells that have good reserves before we make that decision. So we ran, we ran an algorithm. We developed the flow chart and we ran an algorithm on the software and it, it brought up two results. So two wells were seven and then uh, well eight. So uh, this is a brief description of the well. It has a reservoir pressure of about 3,900 PSI, bubble point of um, 2,500, showing you that that particular reservoir is an undersaturated reservoir. And um, we, we looked at the stock of the reservoir and the, the cumulative production from that particular reservoir. So I'm just trying to be fast because of our time. And um, I would like to point you out, point, bring your attention to this. We made a plot of the reservoir pressure and productivity in this over time. If you look at the reservoir pressure on my right, notice that, just look at the cursor, you notice that the reservoir pressure is fairly constant over time, which is something we expect because uh, this reservoir has a good aquifer, has very strong aquifer. So the reservoir pressure is fairly constant over time. But when you look at the productivity index, the PI decreases over time. You know, the PI decreased over time. So telling you that the reservoir pressure of this well is constant, but the productivity index is, 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 um, is, is declining giving you an indication that there's a possibility of a formation damage around the near well bulb. So based on this, we, we built a model on uh, PROSPER, IPM PROSPER, and then we ran sensitivity uh, on the skin from, we played with the skin from the skin of 30 to skin of minus five. So we noticed that as the skin value reduces, the production from that well increases. So we that is for well seven and for well twelve and for well twelve uh, we we carried out a pressure transient analysis and like I told you we were able to uh, separate decompose the skin and eventually we saw we arrived at a skin of thirty two and um, indicating to us that the well has a, a formation damage arising from the near well bore region. So I just, I think I'll skip this because of the time. So um, this is just a brief summary of the production enhancement process. We carried out a slick line run to confirm wellbore accessibility. Coil tubing was used to, uh, as a placement strategy. Uh, injectivity test was carried out with grime and as pre-flush. And after the main micro-emotion treatment, with grime over flush. So then after we allow the well to soak for about um, a day, we open up the well, we notice that we don't even need to nitrogen leave the well as the well, both wells rather, we responded naturally uh, without the need of uh, nitrogen lift. So the result we obtained was encouraging. The initial rate for well seven, for example, was 282 barrels of oil. But after the stimulation, we, the production increased to 1,400 barrels of oil. One for, for 12, from 500 to about, um, I think about 700 barrels of, of oil. So the result we got from the, from most stimulation was encouraging. One from was seven was, uh, I, mean, I, I think it was 
think I need to tell you that, oh, particularly for World 7, we are still enjoying the um, increase in production even until this um, moment. So thank you for listening. At this um, junction, I would like to take some few questions to wrap up our presentation. Thank you. So to, um, Peter, can please coordinate the question. OK. So can we start asking our questions if we have any questions yeah. to ask? We'll take just yes. three because yeah. of time. Because of time, thank you. So let's just take three. Three questions. If, if you have, have a question, so I just turn on your microphone, then shoot. OK, so I, I guess I should just ask mine straightforward since what is. OK. So uh, you, was, you mentioned something about decomposing skin. Yeah. But after taking a maybe a well test analysis, PTA or whatever, we are it was supposed to decompose the skin to know the amount that was caused, I mean the amount that relates to the formation damage itself. Okay. Can, can you be more can you please just pour more light on this because we, we are I'm not used to like the decomposing skin. This, this is like the first time I'm I'm hearing it. All these years, skin, 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 skin. But now you have said we, should, we are supposed to decompose and know which one particularly is as a result of formation damage. So the, my question is, how do we do that? And why is it very essential to do it, basically? OK, OK. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, to, to answer the question, um, but you understand from uh, pressure transient analysis that you can get your skin. Yes, yes. Then, well, so then after you get your skin from pressure transient analysis, in, the next thing is to decompose the skin. The question is how do you go about decomposing the skin? There are several ways of, there are several ways of doing that. You can use a software, Prosper. Should be, most of you should be conversant with um, IPM Prosper. So if you put the properties of the perforation into Prosper, you put the properties of your gravel pack, maybe it's a well that is gravel packed. You put that properties into Prosper. You put your perforation, um, the, the perforation depth into Prosper. It can help you determine the skin as a result of perforation. It can help determine the skin as a result of partial penetration. So it can give you the skin values from this particular area so that you can be able to delineate a particular skin from uh, formation damage. Apart from that, you know, when your vendors deploy gravel pack solutions to your well, you can ask them, what is the skin as a result of this, your gravel pack deployment? They can give you an idea of what the skin is. But you know, like I, I, I make, let me just emphasize that this function, you know, this, the difference between engineering and science is science is absolute, but engineering is relative. It's a function of that particular situation. It's a function of the engineer. It's a function of the experience of that person. So if you discuss with your service guys, they'll, they'll give you a, a particular value of skin. When you go to Prosper, you look at the value of uh, skin you are getting from Prosper. When you put in all the gravel pack properties, you can then as the engineer, then you make your decision. Okay, based on the experience you have, okay, the skin from Prosper is this value, the skin from the uh, company is this value, then you compare and you make your decision. So what am I saying in Russia? What I'm saying in Russia is that the skin, if you have a world that has gravel pack, there's a skin as a result of gravel pack. If you, if you have perforated the well, there's a skin as a result of perforation. There's a skin as a result of cement. In fact, the major one comes from gravel pack. If you have a gravel pack or you have a sand, uh, maybe a standalone skin or whatever, you have it on in that particular well, you have a skin as a result of that. The one from cementing is not that much. So the one from cementing is not that much. But the major ones you have is from gravel pack or a sand exclusion technology that you have adopted for that particular well. And how you can get it, you can get it from Prosper. All you need is put the properties of the gravel pack on Prosper. It can help you calculate skin 
as a result of the gravel park. And you can also ask the vendor, Halibutin, Slumbije, Baker Hooks, they deploy gravel park. So you can ask them, what is the skin as a result of this gravel park on this my world? They can give you an idea of what the skin is. So once you note those values, by the time you get the total skin from your well test analysis, then you can deduct the various skin you have from this uh, to be able to identify what the formation the skin as a result of formation damages. But beside that, if you look down, when I was telling you about um, the various criteria we looked at, uh, I gave you other criteria that you can also um, look at. I gave you other criteria you can also look at. Uh, you look at is the uh, is the production productivity impairment is it localized? You looked at uh, is it uh, where productivity is it caused by reduction in the pressure? So those are other criteria you can also look at to be able to identify whether that well is uh, the reduction in production from that well is as a result of formation damage. So I think, uh, I, I hope I've been able to answer your question, Peter. Do we have any other question? Yes, you, you have answered my question. Okay, do you have any other question? I think we can take one more no, question. And no, guys, any other ask. question? I have one more though. I don't know if, I, if you can. Are you there? No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. okay so for for the, for the project on Rona 7 and 12 wells, I've seen that okay. you, uh, a couple of softwares are used, um, Sepal, right, you have just mentioned to Prosper and the likes. So as just as a brief brief um, answer, can you just give give us the like the steps to to for for all of this to have happened, okay, from so 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 software, we're able to do this. Then moving on with our results, we're able to do this. Just just a brief review of how your results were gotten for this case study, the, the softwares that were used, the particular properties that were looked at for, and then the results. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Okay, okay. Uh, I'm just I, I'm just seeing that a lot of softwares were used and different things were done. I just want as I just want to know how those things were done in steps. Okay, maybe we use this okay. to get this. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me. Let me. I think I understand you. I think I understand you. Um, I would not go into uh, how the how we use Prosper, how we use Sepa, how we because that would be a different ballgame. That would be another thing. Another topic for another time. You know? So, but I would just. Uh, basically, um, try to you know just give you a high-level summary. The first step, as the engineer, you need to understand your well, and one of the ways you understand your well is looking at the well history. You know, as young engineers, when you come into industry, most of the wells you are going to work with, they are wells that were drilled probably in the days of your parents. Some of them were drilled in 1950s, 70s, and all that. Period. The very old wells. So you inheriting these wells as the engineer, the first thing you need to familiarize yourself with is the well history. Look at the history of that well. So there's something called well history. You, you go through the history, you look at how the well has been performing. Then another thing you also look at, which is very key, you know, software is as good as the person using the software. So I won't just dwell more on software. So after you've looked at your well history, then the second thing, you look at your production plots. You look at the production plots. You look at the production plot because the production plot itself tells you the history of that well. It tells you the history of that well. You can look at the production plot from the well level. You can also look at the production plot from the reservoir level. You can also even look at the production plot from the field level. So we looked at those things and it gave us some information. Okay. This well is behaving this particular way. So if you notice, when I was talking about uh, the plot of the reservoir pressure and the PI, I mean, the plot of the reservoir pressure and the PI, you notice the history started from around uh, 1992 down to uh, 20, I think 2018 or so. So 
the, the, it, the history started as early as 1992. So we looked at the back history and we were able to look at trends because history gives you the opportunity to look at various trends that you can play with and have a better understanding of the world. So the first point of all is one is the world history. You look at your production plot and based on that, you can come up with some plots and do a plot of reservoir pressure and productivity index. You can do a plot of reservoir pressure and flowing bottom of pressure. You can do a plot of reservoir pressure and then um, reservoir pressure water production. You can look at how uh, water production has, um, has, has played over time. So there are different plots that you can come up with before you make up your mind. Then from those plots, those plots will throw some information at you and would also create the need for more research. Then you can also, if you have core data, you can look at your core data. In this particular case for World 7, we had core data. So after we looked at the core data, it was from that core data, we saw that we have a lot of clay materials. First part, about 7% of uh, our reservoir rock in that particular area was made up of first part. And we know that first part has the possibility of um, stabilizing emotion in the presence of a surfactant like a um, synthetic oil-based mod. So that gives us an idea that there's a possibility of emotion block within our uh, near reservoir, uh, our near well bore area. So it gives us, it gave us that, uh, that particular idea. So those are some of the things that you can also look at. And after we've made those deductions, then we'll now look at Prosper. How Prosper came about was we wanted to know what would be the increase in production after stimulation. Because like I told you, stimulation is basically we are reducing the skin. So if we reduce the skin, are we going to have an increased production rate or is the production going to remain the same? Or maybe we are not going to get something substantial. Because before you go ahead and stimulate, your management will ask you, what are we expecting from this world? How many barriers are you bringing on board after stimulation? Because you need to carry out an economic evaluation before you carry out um, any stimulation job. So we look, we, we, we keyed in the various of our parameters into Prosper, and we run uh, sensitivity. Sensitivity simply means varying a particular value and seeing how your your well performs after you vary a particular value. So when we vary the value of scale from a value of minus five to thirty, and from a value of thirty to to minus five, we notice we have substantial increase in production. So that gave us an idea that if we can reduce the skin from stimulation, we can have an increase in production. So in fact, we had about we, we did about three cases. We, we used the uh, base case, the low case, and the high case. Our, our base case was 1,000 barrels from both wells. The, the, the low case was 500, while the high case was about uh, 1,500. So we ran economies based on these various scenarios. So, but fortunately for us, after the stimulation job, we got an increase in production of about 1,200, which was far above the uh, base case that we considered. So just to summarize, um, the first thing is you look at your well history. After you look at the well history, next step is look at your production performance. And after the production performance, you look at, you can make different plots. You can do a plot of reservoir pressure versus PI. You can do a plot of reservoir pressure versus water production. You can, do, you can run various um, uh, plots. And after you've done that, um, if you, you notice some things, you can um, do a model on Prosper. You can do a model on Prosper. Once you build your model on Prosper and see if you, if your, by varying the skin, if your production increase, that's that is another step. You understand? Then for the one of cell power, cell power is just like a, it's a library that houses all our reservoir and well data. So on cell power, you can come up with some, some criteria and say, okay, please give me wells that have uh, uh, res reservoir pressure within this range. Results within this range, you understand? Volumes within this range. So you can bring up various criteria because sometimes you have wells as much as 300. And so you might not have that time to go looking at the various details of those wells one by one. So once you run an algorithm on, on, on SEPA, you just you build your algorithm code on SEPA, it can give you those wells that meet that particular criteria. And then you begin to drill in, into those wells by looking at the well history, like I told, told you looking at the production performance and then um, making different plots. Like in this particular case, saw the plot of 
the reservoir pressure and the productivity index. And after that, if you need to do a model of prosper, and do a model of prosper. But there's also something I also want to make mention of here is that you can also work with your reservoir engineer because in some cases your reservoir engineer might have a dynamic model that is better representative than uh, prosper because prosper is just uh, just one D. So your is a dynamic model from the reservoir engineer is much more detailed. So you can bring all this and then see if you have uh, production gain as a result of the stimulation job. So uh, basically, that is just the summary. Peter. That's just the summary. Hello, Peter. Yes, sir. That, that was that was that was that was enough for for me to. Okay. So I have a question. Please, I have a question. Uh, okay. I have a question. Okay. Uh, but, um, we've been talking about Cepal um Prosper. Um, since um, I want to ask if the um idea of machine learning and data science is also applicable. Okay, thank you very much. That's a very good question. But for this particular case, uh, it's it is not applicable. For this particular case, it's not applicable. When you talk about machine learning, uh, you have some, you you it's just like making your world smart. So it's just like making your Google smart. So you need some infrastructure to be in place before you deploy uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and all that. For example, where a well that you don't have downhole gauge, so you you might not know the reservoir pressure. So you need some time before you go you go with your speak line check what the main bottom hole pressure is, and then do your analysis and all that. So for this well, it doesn't have those infrastructure. And when in a way you have you you deploy deploy artificial intelligence and all that you can, you should be able to remotely shut down that well and you need infrastructure towards that and that costs money and you need to look at the economics uh, of that before you even talk about deploying such kind of infrastructure that can give you that kind of advantage. Those these wells, these two wells that we looked at, they are wells that we still need to go to the feed physically to open up or shut down. So we don't have that infrastructure to be able to remotely open it up or shut it down. And um, so for machine learning and artificial intelligence was not really, was not adapted to this because of, we don't have the infrastructure in place to be able to do that. Most cases where you, you make use of machine learning and artificial intelligence, you, you can make use of it offshore, where you are producing as high as maybe 50,000 barrels of oil. And uh, you can have that, uh, you don't have access. Because sometimes when you have, uh, Wet trees. Wet trees are subsurface trees. So we are trees within the within the water. They are underneath the underneath the sea. So you you cannot just go down there and open up or shut down. So in that particular case, uh, deploying that infrastructure does make sense because once with the with uh, those infrastructure, you can be able to detect. Oh, okay, I'm having formation damage on time. Is you are not reactive. You are being proactive. So once you once you notice it on time, you can give run some programs, and those programs can automatically respond to uh, changing reservoir and well condition. You understand? So, like what I'm saying in a nutshell is that you need infrastructure to de to deploy those things. And for these particular wells, we looked at those infrastructures are not there. And the reason why they are not there is that it doesn't make any economic sense. Looking at the production from that well uh, to deploy such uh capital intensive infrastructure you know so that is why they are not there so for this particular one it is not there but that is the next step generally in the oil and gas industry but it is not as if uh, the oil and gas we are just deploying those things deploying smart wells and all that it comes at a cost but for when we notice that the production from that well is very high and it would make that econ economic sense then we can now go ahead and deploy such level of interior, such level of infrastructure and make the well smart, so to say. So for this particular way, it was not deployed because production from that well doesn't justify having such level of um, infrastructure to accommodate um, machine learning and uh, you know, artificial intelligence technology and all that. So um, I hope I've been able to answer your question. Hello? Yes, sir, you've been able, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, so uh, I just want to say once again, I appreciate the opportunity.
to be able to um, have this presentation with you guys. And I want to encourage you. Uh, this is this is a, is a micro emission technology is a new technology in the oil and gas industry. So do more research about it. You can read more more on this in textbooks and go online, search for more materials that will give you more understanding. And most especially the criteria I highlighted to you, those criteria are very key. You know, get conversant with those criteria because a lot of engineers, even in the industry, are making mistakes. They do simulation work and they are not really getting results. So try to familiarize yourself with this. And um, I would also appreciate um, the SP president in the last chapter. You know, this forum is very good because during my time, we never had something like this. But uh, because uh, I was uh, I was among the second set that graduated from University of Lagos, Petroleum and Gas Engineering. So well, we never had opportunities like this. So it's an opportunity that you are making use of. Take full advantage of it. And I know that in your careers, you will excel. So uh, thank you very much. Um, Akin, I don't know if you have one last word to say. Yeah, so thank you very much, Mr. Yomi. I believe everybody has learned a couple of things already, and we are very grateful. So on behalf of SP in Ilag, we say a very big thank you for for sparing your time to give us this this very enlightening session. I pray that God strengthens you, and at the end of it, God bless you. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you to everybody too that joined the meeting. I hope we have all learned learned one or two things. So thank you very much, okay. everybody. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you.